Without further ado, we look forward to hearing from you and want to jump right in. Obviously, there's a lot of things happening in the headlines, so no, no question about that. So we will get to some current events as part of our discussion this morning, including uh, Ukraine and other issues. But really, let's focus on the document that the White House uh, traditionally releases. It's the foreign policy document that informs other documents and um, strategies, primarily the Defense Department's defense strategy, right? In theory, one flows from the other, uh, and the Defense Department takes its guidance from the White House. The expectations were that this document would be out about now, but I think that's been delayed for a variety of reasons, according to friends and colleagues in the administration, one of which, of course, are current events in Eastern Europe. But another is because of um, just general delays on the 23 budget and its associated documents. I do think the national security strategy will be out next week, excuse me, next month. Nonetheless, we already have an interim national strategic guidance from the White House, which they issued last March, about 10 months ago. But before that, the last full strategy issued by the White House was in the Trump administration in December of 2017. And so, you know, we, this administration, of course, it's a little late, but again, we already have a preview of, I think, where the larger document's going to go. I believe the focus will be on domestic renewal, which is interesting because, again, this is a foreign policy document, but I'm going to let my colleagues dive into that more uh, to talk about it. So let me introduce them briefly. Dr. Gabe Scheinman, he is the executive director of the Alexander Hamilton Society. We're going to talk more about what AHS does and uh, all that they are dedicated to in foreign policy, economics policy, and national security policy. Before joining Alexander Hamilton, Gabe worked at the Center for Strategic and International Studies and at the Jewish Policy Center, where he co-edited a journal of international affairs. Okay, so I'm the only one here today, clearly without a PhD. Dr. Paul Leto, he served as senior director at the National Security Council staff um, at the White House in the mid-2000s. He's also worked at the Department of State and a variety of other places. He is a widely published author, uh, for example, of Ronald Reagan and his quest, quest to abolish nuclear weapons. He's a, a co-chair of the Forum for American Leadership's Strategic Planning Working Group. He's also on the board of the Alexander Hamilton Society. You're getting the vibe this morning that we are a cult here. Yes, indeed. He served as a law clerk uh, and done many other prestigious things in his career. And we're going to talk this morning about his most recent article in the Texas National Security Review called U.S. National Security Strategy Lessons Learned. So to tee it up perfectly for you, Paul, can we jump in with you based on your research, your work, and your scholarship? What should we expect national security strategies to actually accomplish, right? Do they do they match the world as it is? Are they visionary documents? Uh, how have previous administrations approached this? And, and how has that compared to how these documents work today? Great. Thank you, yeah. Mackenzie. Uh, thank you for having Gabe and me. Uh, delighted to be here. Uh, delighted to speak in my in my personal capacity on on all of these issues and and to join you all. Um, let me give a a very quick summary of of the history of these documents and why they matter. During the Cold War, almost every presidential administration uh, did a classified that is obviously secret and internal process that put a lot a lot of emphasis on understanding who our adversaries were, what they're up to, and what that means for us, and then developing a strategy that would peacefully and over the long term deal with those challenges. But they were very focused on the best of them were, on what the what our competitors and rivals were up to. So that was the case for almost all of the administrations throughout the Cold War. That changed partly because uh, Congress passed a law in 1986 as part of the Goldwater-Nichols Act, which in theory requires administrations to issue an annual national security strategy. Um, and the law currently says that that should be both, both classified and unclassified. But basically, since the end of the Cold War, these documents have been speeches or rhetoric that are designed to signal to audiences internally and externally what the administration's priorities are in national security. That hasn't always worked for reasons I'm sure we'll talk about. Um, and it started to change in the prior administration where the Trump administration issued an NSS that was very focused 
on the rivalries with China in particular and also Russia. Um, and that did kick off a broader internal classified planning process. And we might talk about the Trump administration's approach. Um, we are now in a position where the Biden administration has issued an interim guidance, which had not been done before. That was done about a year ago in March. And as you say, we expect them to issue their document, the NSS, uh, very shortly, probably next month. Great. Uh, so with that in mind, Gabe, can you give us a sense for then, I mean, I know we're talking about the Biden administration. Let's go back to this focus on domestic renewal in a foreign policy document. And tell me if that's what you would envision for a conservative national security strategy. What might that look like? How might it be different? Uh, you know, this is a good segue, I, I think, after your, your answer to talk about the Forum for American Leadership, of which we are all members. I think we self-characterize um, as a group, as conservative internationalists, um, trying to put a new, fresh look on um, traditional foreign policy, take uh, changing, I think, a little bit from the lens, perhaps, of previous Republican administrations from the last 20 years. But I, I don't want to overstep here. So if you were king for a day and writing this document, Gabe, what would it say? Uh, thanks, Mackenzie, and, and thanks to uh, AEI for, for having us uh, here today. AEI is a great partner with AHS. We'll talk about that a little later, but just uh, wonderful to have so many friends uh, in the building, uh, virtually or physically in the building for that matter. So um, so let me let me uh, rephrase your question just a little bit in the sense that um, I, I don't think that um, kind of Republican national security strategy or conservative-based national security strategies, the, the purpose, let's call it, is domestic renewal because um, that kind of uh, assumes that uh, uh, that a renewal is needed or or it defined in a certain way that it's needed. Um, however, I will say that I think if you look at um, both the Trump national security strategy and what we expect to have the Biden one, there actually are lengthy uh, sections on what you would normally consider domestic policy, because at the end of the day, what is the purpose of foreign policy? Um, you know, at the end of the day, you hope that uh, elected leaders understand it is about protecting, you know, American lives, protecting American communities, uh, creating more and better jobs, uh, more uh, meaningful and fulfilling lives. Uh, uh, and all these things, I think, are um, threatened uh, by external actors in a variety of ways. And that's what the national security strategy is hopefully supposed to lay out. So I think it's normal that these two things are connected. Um, and again, in our Forum for American Leadership um, Strategic Planning Working Group paper, um, you know, which I think uh, was on the AEO website, uh, we do spend a good amount of time talking about what is it that we're trying to defend here um, and why does it matter? And I do feel sometimes over the past generation, we've gotten a little too far away from that. Um, and it's nice to see both the previous administration, I think the current one really focusing it there. Um, but I think it then goes back into like, well, what is, is there a need for renewal or what specifically is a need for renewal? And uh, might conservatives and, and liberals kind of see that differently? Uh, in the interim, in the Biden administration's interim uh, national security guidance that you mentioned in past March, the way they define it essentially is the build back better bill. You know, it's climate change, uh, health care access, you know, universal uh, daycare, a number of kind of, you know, more traditional, let's call it kind of progressive uh, policies. Uh, I got to imagine the conservatives would not agree that in the same way. Um, on the foreign for American leadership point, um, and which we're all involved with, you know, I think the focus is exactly that, which is to try and provide uh, uh, practical, um, but also kind of historically grounded, you know, policy advice um, to, you know, conservative leaders when over the last, you know, six or seven years, there's been a little bit of a crack up um, on the kind of conservative internationalist side of things uh, as to what everybody can agree to or not agree to. And I'm sure we can get into that too. And so our hope in our working group paper, um, you know, provide an alternative uh, uh, so that when people are reading the Biden administration's national security strategy, they know what they're comparing it to. So let me just pause there for a moment and spice it up. Cause I, I guess I really, I'm not a student of these documents. I tend to focus honestly on the defense strategy, like I said, of which, from which presumably, you know, it flows from the security strategy as in defense is the, the child, foreign policy is the parent. I, I would argue those two relationships have been inverted too often in the last 20 years since 9-11 uh, for, for, for the worse, not for the better. Um, so I, I'm all for a robust security strategy, but both of you now have me thinking, should there be then a national domestic strategy? Because I, I get it. I, I love to preach about, you know, the 
the Navy, the Marine Corps, and the Coast Guard, and how they keep the sea lanes free and open, and how Americans have quickly learned that matters for supply chains and things arriving on time. And they see the Ever Given and the Suez, and all of a sudden, you know, birthday presents don't show up. Like this stuff, right? right just like commerce, global commerce, right? Keeping the shipping lanes open, that kind of stuff matters. So there's always this link for, to domestic and foreign policy. I don't want to over preach here, but like, I, I guess I'm struck by your point, Gabe, that the you know this isn't unusual to talk so much about domestic policy, but maybe should they not be separate documents? And then where you really are, you know, you can make some reference to it, but am I crazy? And why isn't there a domestic strategy document where they can just only talk about Build Back Better, for example? Well, let me maybe I'll chime in real quick and then and then turn to Paul. So um, part of it also is the changing nature of the threat, right? Which is that um, today when we think about threat from you know the Chinese Communist Party, the PRC, uh, it's not purely in what we would previously consider you know kind of external or international terms. Uh, anything from you know technology to uh, supply chains uh, to uh, you know stealing of you know theft of American IP uh, to surveillance uh, to drugs, uh, right? Uh, it's a fentanyl problem. I mean, and the list goes on and on and on. Uh, these, it's not like we can just kind of wall ourselves off neatly and say, well, this is a foreign policy problem as opposed to a domestic pro policy problem or energy security, right? Um, how do you untangle these things, if at all? Uh, it's a separate question, I think, to like, okay, well, now that you've maybe acknowledged that there is a bit of a blurring and how to understand that, uh, uh, how do you actually put together guidance uh, for the U.S. government, first and foremost, uh, uh, to actually execute? And what does that look like? Um, I don't know if I would support putting one sort of comprehensive document to try and explain all U.S. government actions in one place, both foreign and domestic. I think it would be sort of a, a dumpster fire if there was even an attempt at that. Uh, but uh, but I do think, um, and again, you'll see it in our paper, you'll probably see it in the Biden administration paper, you saw it in the Trump NSS, uh, that it's hard to sort of separate these spheres out so neatly. But I don't, Paul, I don't know what you think. Well, a couple of points. I, um, one, um, obviously, there's a connection between foreign policy and domestic policy, and they intersect with the NSS in a couple of ways. The first is, I think it's important, particularly for the kind of public facing side of an NSS, to communicate that there is both a positive case and a negative case um, for uh, America's continued leadership in the world. That is, there are negative consequences if we are not preeminent in the world. The positive case, obviously, is that if we set the rules of the international road, which we have for decades now, it by and large advantages Americans in real ways, economically and so on. If we do not, if we do not lead in setting the rules of the road, others intend to like China, and they will set them in ways that disadvantage Americans economically and that will have real impacts domestically. And that should be said it was said in 2017 in the Trump administration, NSS, and the administration currently should build on that. And it's important for people to hear that. Um, and then to come back to the point that Gabe made, the purpose of an NSS should be to establish a long-term set of objectives and means so that America can address challenges from foreign threats peacefully and sustainably, meaning in a bipartisan way and that we have the resources for domestically. And that has a whole host of ramifications, Mackenzie, as you note, for that means we have to make certain investments now in defense spending, defense industrial base, technology, and so on. And uh, again, the NSS now really should emphasize that. It should though, I think, stay away from um, some of the domestic politics, which if it gets too far into, which I think the interim NSS maybe did for Biden, could actually be counterproductive for the purpose of building that kind of bipartisan sustainable strategy. Can I can I just add one small thing to what Paul said on the interim national security guidance they put yeah. out last March? Twenty five pages. I don't, I don't want to say it's a quick read, but uh, it is still a, a little bit at the 30,000 foot level um, in terms of what's there. It is meant to be kind of interim and a guidance. But um, to Paul's point, if you read it, it really does sound like the president's domestic policy priorities. It essentially says, you know, solve the existential crisis of climate change, combat systemic racism, right? Promote diversity, uh, uh, you know, provide uh, equity, uh, you know, in the world, economic equity and domestically and in the world in that way. So to their credit, uh, I think they've managed to or, or planning to, let's call it, uh, properly integrate 
their domestic policy agenda with, you know, what you might need to do externally to do that. Whereas I feel like conservatives maybe don't do that as well. There's a, there's a larger disconnect maybe uh, in that vein. Uh, but I don't think we're going to see that many surprises when it does come out uh, on those agenda items. There's the next question, which is now that the president's uh, Build Back Better bill has does not seem to be making its way uh, uh, into law, what does that mean for a national security strategy that seems to be based on actually advancing or protecting that? Mackenzie, can I just make a final point here and, and to back up a little bit, um, the Forum for American Leadership, and, and this is the paper that's on the screen now, um, we put out a document that is uh, pretty short, it's less than 10 pages, it's almost all bullet points. And the, the point of it is to lay out the elements of a national security strategy that we think could garner bipartisan support and would be effective and sustainable for the long term. And again, there were two points that Gabe alluded to um, for why we did it, basically. One is to try to um, influence the administration's NSS in, possible, in positive ways, if that's possible, and then also to create a kind of benchmark to measure their NSS against when it comes out. So I do encourage people to take a look at that document. And it does lay out, I think, how we see the interactions between, uh, if you will, the, the uh, domestic um, uh, sphere and then foreign policy. Well, I just got to make a little quip here. Um, so your document is shorter than the White House's guidance. But I remember when the Obama administration's guidance uh, around the time of the pivot when they had to, Pentagon had to promptly go throw out the strategy they had just written and issued. Uh, it was a 12 page document. So uh, we see guidance creep, which is no surprise, but I'm glad to see and hear um, the objectives of your paper, that it's simple, it's quick. It's not just what can and should be done, that it's bipartisan and it's a benchmark to grade this White House when, when their version does come out. That's all very helpful. And I want to get to what these these organizations are, this Forum for American Leadership. I don't know that it's a household name yet. So let's talk about that in a minute. But before we do, I because we, Paul, um, talking today and, and talking ahead of time about our discussion today, you know, I'm just struck by the headlines. And, you know, we're all watching uh, with anxiety, you know, what's the events of Eastern Europe, um, not just Russia amassing troops, but all the kinds of other ways that the Russia threatens not just our allies and uh, friends in Europe, but Americans back here, as he referenced things like cyber, um, misinformation, disinformation, deception, military deception. The White House warned of that last week, which was really interesting because military deception is not something that's been a big public conversation in the American psyche for the last two decades uh, during counterinsurgency, even though it was happening regularly with ISIS and, and other groups in Iraq and Afghanistan. So I was I was glad to hear that, although also a little scared by what it all means. But Paul and, and Gabe, if you want to jump in, how does this document, th these, these words on paper inform current events? So, you know, do you think the White House right now is flipping through to page seven of the draft security strategy saying, all right, here's what it means for what we should do about Russia and Ukraine, or is it really just visionary or is it just, just PR? Let me, um, let me answer that question first by saying what I hope is not happening. And I hope what is not happening is that the administration had a draft of their NSS and that it was um, maybe mealy mouth or not direct about the current leadership of Russia and they are now concerned about how that might appear if they issue it. And so they are now holding it or revising it in light of what's been happening in Ukraine. As a general principle, if you have to hold your NSS, which is supposed to be your foundational document for foreign policy in light of some current event, then by definition, you're doing it wrong. So, and this is why in our document, we, we try to point out the essence of a strategy should be understanding clearly who your adversaries are and what they're up to and what it means for us. And I think the current leadership of Russia, as we've discovered over painful experience over the last couple of decades, is determined to be a destabilizing force and to undermine American leadership when and where it can and to divide allies and so on. And that has ramifications in terms of what U.S. policy ought to be. In other words, the policy ought to have been a year ago focused on deterring the current leadership of Russia 
from the kind of threats it's now making and may embark on in Ukraine and elsewhere in Europe. So that is where you know the, the power of these documents, if they're done correctly, is to understand clearly who and what your threats are, and then set a long-term policy. And I, I am somewhat concerned, I don't know, and I hope this isn't true, but I am somewhat concerned that they are putting the cart before the horse and now kind of reacting to what to what Putin and the current Russian leadership is doing, rather than having a course set in their minds and then trying to shape the environment in which the Russian leadership operates. And Before you answer, Gabe, hold on. Let me just, let me throw a second point to you, okay? Whatever your answer was, but then answer me this. So Paul just talked about the essence of a strategy. Does it also by default then mean what you won't do? Does it help you identify, maybe even if it's not the words on the paper, but it's just what you know, when you will and won't intervene, for example, militarily. Sorry to cut you off there, Gabe. No, and th and I think if you look at that, that's a that's a good question, and I'll I'll tackle that first and go back to what I was going to say. Um, if you actually look in the interim in, in their own interim national security guidance, they actually do talk about the things they won't do. Um, they talk about how uh, uh, you know the the, mil the use of the uh, military uh, will be diminished. Uh, they talk about how they are not going to fight uh, counterinsurgency. They talk about how they are going not going to. Um, uh, use force uh, in the Middle East as much. They talk about how they are not going to uh, support uh, allies uh, uh, in military conflict in the Middle East, if you actually look at it. Um, so they do lay that out. Um, sometimes it's actually these tests uh, that we see, uh, you know, uh, test to the United States that actually uh, clarify that. Um, so, you know, one of the things that is now evident um, you know, and the, the administration has had to come out and say it is that the United States will not send troops uh, to Ukraine in any capacity as part of this crisis, or maybe even into the future, which three months ago, they weren't willing to say that out loud, but now they have because they've been forced to kind of clarify uh, or show their hand on it. Um, and so that might be something that, you know, to, to Paul's point, maybe it wasn't going to be in writing uh, two months ago, but now may may enter a, a, a draft um, in that vein. Um, the other thing I was going to say, and it, and it kind of ties into your, your follow-up question, which is um, one of the other uh, purposes uh, of a document is that it allows you to uh, try and uh, dis uh, untangle or clarify uh, inconsistencies with how you're approaching or thinking things. It's not perfect. Uh, you're never going to do it. It is the U.S. government at the end of the day. Uh, but um, to give an example on the Russia crisis, um, I don't think that this administration ever thought that Russia was going to be friendly. Um, you know, and, and they've talked about it, and I believe in the interim NSS, they talk about it as a destabilizing actor. The question is, what does that mean? If that's your assessment, what do you expect the Russians to do? And what is the rest of your policy? So if you expect the Russians to be destabilizing, why is it that, you know, you're, you, you give them a clean new start extension? If you expect them to be destabilizing, you know, why is it that you basically are, wanted to, you know, argue for a cut in the defense budget? If you want them to be destabilizing, why is it that you wanted to uh, uh, reduce the role of nuclear weapons in your defense posture? Uh, Nord Stream 2, the list kind of goes on and on and on. And theoretically, um, the, the, the planning process by which the NSS is produced is an opportunity to try and work out uh, some of those, what I would consider inconsistencies, uh, which, you know, ended up could either bear fruit or or, or lead to chaos uh, uh, if they're actually tested on the world stage. Preach. <laughs> That's all I have to say to everything. Yeah, not very optimistic. <laughs> Your last answer, just preach. Okay. Yeah. Amen. Or whatever. The term is here to foot stomp everything you just said. Uh, to some of your points about what the interim guidance said they won't do, they're promptly turning around and about to do, I believe, right? So 80. 500 troops are at the ready for deployment at any moment, for example, to Eastern Europe uh, and a variety of other uh, things that you ticked off. I believe the administration is currently reviewing. It's funny how things change um, uh, uh, when when the moment gets really critical. And, as it and, is. and just on that as an example, uh, the administration uh, came in uh, arguing that actually sanctions were actually overused mm -hmm. as a tool of American statecraft, okay. right, and actually issued new guidance within Treasury to you know, tighten or narrow when they would use them in different ways. And most people, when they thought about it, they thought about more or less in the case of Iran, and maybe to a certain degree, China going in the future. And yet, you know, what is it, what is the central response, let's call it, uh, to the Ukraine crisis? Essentially, is we're going to sanction the crap uh, out of the Russians. We're going to cut them off from this. We're going to export control that. We're going to do it. And so again, you now have this inconsistency of here is this tool that you know, obviously was used to great effect by the previous administration and to a certain degree, the Obama administration, too, for that matter. Right. Um, that has grown and grown and grown. The instinct comes in and said, you know, let's let's kind of mow it, mow it down a little bit. And yet 
you know, at the end of the day, they're back to, well, actually, this is our primary response. Official term there on sanctions, Gabe use. Uh, Paul, before I move on, did you want to jump in on that or do you want to just start talking a little bit about the Forum for American Leadership? No, I, I think Gabe summarized it well with respect to Russia. Um, the uh, Forum for American Leadership, um, it is a essentially a network um, of those of us who are conservative internationalists. So it includes lots of people who are in the Trump administration, lots of people who are in the Bush administration and prior administrations. Um, working together to come up with some essentially consensus um, positions and policies. And again, for two reasons. One is to nudge the Biden administration in helpful directions where we can, um, and then also to set up constructive benchmarks that their policies can be measured against. So um, the, the working groups are set up a little bit like a, kind of an NSC staff would be within a White House, so broken down by uh, regional and, and functional uh, issues. Um, and, uh, for those of you who haven't seen the products yet, go to the website. There are lots of different papers from lots of different working groups. And Mackenzie, I did want to say your defense working group, Mackenzie is a co-chair of that, uh, along with, um, Bridge Colby and Eric Tuning. Um, you've been great and productive and putting out terrific products. So everyone should go look at that working group's national defense strategy paper, among others on the website. Well, thank you for the plug. I sure do appreciate it. Uh, yeah, we've been typical defense-minded people, right? Just cranking out product for everyone. So if, if the question has been asked on the Hill, I'd like to think we've been answering it for policymakers. Well, and also in the executive branch uh, at the Department of Defense as well. And trying to tackle all of these kind of, we're getting at the now the more central question, right? So let me just drill down briefly into the defense strategy because um, it's going to be, I think, you know, very reflective, of course, of where the White House wants it to go. I, the three domestic priorities are something mushy like that. If you, I don't know how to characterize it um, as a non-hard power priorities will feature prominently in the defense strategy because the secretary has told us that. Uh, and that will be, of course, climate change, COVID relief and response, as well as the next preparation for the next pandemic, and then diversity, inclusion, equity, elimination of racism, assault, extremism. So those are the three sort of priorities. And then there is a threat list. And I believe in the mind of the secretary, they're, they're somewhat distinct because the threat list is going to, of course, number 1A is China. 1B, maybe it's a little unclear how they're going to thread that needle is Russia. And then I believe counter is sort of dropping off the list, uh, as far as I understand it, inside the building. And then, you know, we know the middle tier challenges of, of North Korea, Iran, et cetera. Um, so China, it's we're half hour into our discussion. And, you know, it, this this is we're getting now into the priority for the largest bureaucracy, one of the largest organizations on the planet, the Defense Department. And they're going to state explicitly that this is the priority. So, gentlemen, uh, it, do you think that's fair for the secretary to have these domestic priorities woven into this agency, that this organization that exists, but frankly, to deter, but if needed, to kill in the name of the state, essentially? to get back to some sort of functioning level of peace are his priorities about right. I mean, it's going to have fancy bumper stickers, things like integrated deterrence. He's going to mean that I think in a variety of ways, more reliance on allies, uh, using other tools of American statecraft more prominently and not the military. And then these other domestic ways, I think he's got a three part integrated deterrence approach. Uh, but how do you balance this China first? And then all of these other, other um, problems that, that the federal government has to deal with. And do you think the Pentagon's got it about right or assuming that this is what they issue or not? Um, go ahead, Paul. Go ahead, Gib. Oh, okay. So, so first what I was gonna say is uh, we should be able to do more than one thing at a time, uh, number one. Uh, uh, you know, it's kind of um, insane if we're in a place where uh, we need to be able to choose that there's really only one thing we can focus on, uh, given the scope uh, and scale of our resources and abilities and, frankly, our track record to do more than once. So, um, you know, I might disagree uh, with uh, the secretary's uh, order of priorities and what he's chosen to focus on, because it doesn't seem to me it should be the priority mission of the Department of Defense. But they also could pursue these while also uh, uh, pursuing a proper posture and 
in preparation for China and Russia and Iran and other concerns for that matter. We, we shouldn't have to choose in that vein. Uh, the president, um, and it goes back to the defense budget, and, and Mackenzie will we'll welcome more your thoughts than ours on this, which is um, there are political realities to a certainty. That's true. But at the end of the day, um, there's absolutely nothing stopping our elected leaders from making the case uh, for why we should be either spending more or doing more or what have you. The Biden administration seems at the same time to be saying, you know, the world is ending. This is the greatest greatest crises or combination of crises uh, that the United States has ever seen. And they're talking about domestic crises, for that matter, in addition to foreign ones. Uh, and yet, essentially, uh, we're going to kind of put a cut uh, into the defense budget. That's a choice. Um, and sadly, it's one that over the last 10 years, we've been making the, the, each time the wrong choice. And so it's not in my mind, so much uh, should or should not the Department of Defense care about some of the issues that you laid out and the secretary laid out. Again, it's a Democratic administration. I don't think we should be so surprised. Uh, it's more uh, that is, are they making a choice between spending time and resources on that versus dealing with some of the threats that, that we all care about? I feel like this also comes into play in the NSS when they talk about climate change. Um, the, the rhetoric coming over the last year, both in documents and by speeches, seems to think that at the very same time, we can vigorously compete with China uh, on all sorts of issues that are worth competing on, whatever that means, uh, but at the very same time, actually cooperate with them uh, and Russia for that matter on what the administration uh, will say is a, is a planetary or existential crisis, i.e. the crisis of climate change. And that's where the, the, the trade-off and priorities becomes a problem because doing something in one degree, in one domain, uh, even if even if you think it won't succeed, will um, will create a wedge or create problems in the other one. And that's what worries me more. It's it's not that um, it's not about time and focus. It's about if we uh, end up partnering with the Chinese in some climate change initiative uh, and we have determined that to be the number one national security threat to the United States, then by definition, we're going to feel uh, co-opted or, or to certainly be bound to try not to rock the boat and all the other things that they've been rocking the boat on for a long time. Paul. Yeah, a couple of thoughts. One is in our paper on the Forum for American Leadership paper on the national security strategy, we try to point out who the Chinese leadership is and what they're up to and what it means for us. And we try to define fairly succinctly that this is an ethno-nationalist Leninist party state that wants to establish a party, excuse me, a tribute state system in Asia and ultimately to displace America as the preeminent global power. We believe that to be true. We believe the evidence over the last several decades has borne that out. If you believe that, it makes it more difficult, I think, to say, as this administration, I, I think, may intend to do, we will compete with China in certain spheres and we will cooperate in others. We do not think that is how the current leadership of the PRC sees the world and sees the relationship. And so I think you know, Gabe and I and our working group have talked about if the U.S. government perceives that it can kind of neatly cabin the spheres of competition and cooperation, we will ultimately be uh, disillusioned, and I'll put that euphemistically. So in other words, the relationship ought to be dealt with from a competitive standpoint and from the objective of this ought to be a peaceful competition, one that advantages America. Um, and to do that, we need to shape the environment in which China makes decisions. So to come back to some of the points that, that Gabe made, um, I worry somewhat that by prioritizing areas of supposed cooperation, right, climate change, pandemic is one they listed in the inter interim guidance, um, arms control, nonproliferation, China's record on these issues, again, I will put it euphemistically, um, is not cooperative and not particularly helpful. So the direction, I have some concerns about the direction the NSS uh, may be headed. To get back to your question about the NDS and defense policy, it is essential in these documents to set priorities. And to its credit, the previous administration, the Trump administration, set priorities, both in the NSS and the NDS. And you can argue about whether the priorities were correct, but that's what they did. And it, it, they intended it to have ramifications in the budget process, Mackenzie, as you indicated and, and elsewhere. I worry that in the NSS and the NDS, if this administration or any administration puts too much emphasis, particularly on, on some divisive domestic politics, uh, 
into these documents that it makes it harder to form that bipartisan sustainable strategy that administrations of both parties did during the Cold War. So Truman to Eisenhower, for example. Um, and, and I worry that if, if we see that at home, that our competitors will also see that abroad. And can I just one more point on that is um, to, to go back to the to, to, you, to show an example of that kind of in real time. So if you go back to the Obama administration and to a certain degree, if you actually looked at the president's uh, track record prior to coming into office of what was the thing he cared about the most, to a certain degree, it was something like the nuclear zero. It was something he'd actually written about even going back to college among a number of ways. And so when the president led the United States into the Iran nuclear deal, in his mind, and again, we can we can uh, debate whether he was right or wrong. I happen to think he was wrong. But in his mind, he was like, I've, I've parked or I've you know, done a real good job handling the most important priority to me, which is to a certain degree uh, restraining um, or delaying uh, Iranian nuclear weapons development. But as a consequence of that, um, even though rhetorically the administration kept saying, but we will at the same time be just as strong in pushing back on Ron's, you know, malignant activity and proxies and support for terrorism and killing of dissidents and human rights and all those things. At the end of the day, they just couldn't or they wouldn't uh, because they were concerned about rocking the boat on the Iran nuclear deal. And one of my biggest concerns when it comes to this administration is that when it comes to climate change issues with uh, China or even to a certain degree pandemic stuff with others, uh, when it comes to arms control issues uh, with Russia, uh, that they're uh, they're going to get locked into a process um, that then will um, internally it's almost it's like self censorship. They will uh, say, well, we can't possibly push back on these other items because the Russians will you know walk away or you know not get to where we need them to get on the thing that we care about the most. And we've communicated it that way too. If you go to the interim NSS, it talks about you know, uh, strategic stability talks with Russia uh, in a lot of ways. We gave them a new, cl uh, a clean new start extension from the get-go with no negotiations. And so that's that's where these trade-offs, if you will, and priorities, and that's to go back to Paul's point, that's where the NSS and the NDS uh, are really important as a, as a messaging mechanism uh, to the U.S. government, but also to the American people. So the American people can understand if they're saying these are their priorities, then they may be willing to, you know, sacrifice or not care about or pay less attention to the other things in order to try and achieve them or keep them safe. Good. Uh, I want to remind the audience to please send in your questions. We already have a few, and I'm going to, I'm going to jump to those in just a moment. Um, uh, you can email Hallie Coin below at AEI.org or use the hashtag AEINSS on Twitter, again, to remind our listeners. Uh, and we're going to get back to some of those great points you both made on budgeting and sort of um, there's a good question about sort of resourcing here and linking it to the documents. And, and I want to talk about that. But before I do, Gabe, you just talked about the American people. And obviously, you know, White Houses are, you know, the, those who, who sit in the Oval are elected by those American people. And presumably, these documents reflect something that's been sort of discussed with them to some extent. I, I guess my question is, do you see with the, through your work, particularly with the Alexander Hamilton Society, um, any sort of split in, in the U.S. populace by generation or by group of any kind about foreign policy particular, uh, in particular, but actually any, any policy, if you want to cover that, if you have that data. Uh, give me a sense of where you see the youth of America. Broadly speaking, I know this you know, it could be a four day conference all just on this one question. So I'm not, <laughs> trying, to, I'm not trying to overgeneralize. I don't want to pretend like we are going to give everybody all of the answers here. But tell me what you're seeing, because um, when I think when too often when we use the term American people, I think we refer to, for example, just voters or the loudest voters, which tend to be no offense, baby boomers. Um, so anyway, the floor is yours to just uh, with my very poorly worded open question. Uh, thanks. No, and, and I think a lot of elected leaders um, sometimes they always they only use the American people in context where uh, the American people agrees with them, uh, not in context where they say, well, you know, I, I don't care what people say, but I think this way. It's always it's always to kind of foot stomp their own views. Um, I appreciate that and give me an opportunity to kind of also talk about AHS and, and the work we're doing. Um, it's kind of two two different levels. So one is kind of I'd say overall, and the other is kind of with among younger people, um, which is you know overall I, I actually think that like there are the American people does have kind of clear uh, uh, priorities or interests in a variety of things. And it's evident in a lot of polling. I mean, both both Pew and Gallup and um, Chicago Council on Global Affairs actually does a lot of uh, polling uh, regularly on uh, Americans' foreign policy views. And what you generally find is that are although there are splits on certain issues between Republicans and Democrats and 
you know, uh, baby boomers and uh, 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 I forget what the post millennial generation is called these days, but but the kind of age gap on some things that's true, but on other things like it's there, you know. So China is one good example, which is you know it's it, there's not a huge split in the American people amongst either you know either of those four categories, however you want to kind of split them up, uh, about how Americans view China. They're concerned. Uh, you know, they see it as a threat. They see it as an adversary. They're concerned of all its activity that we can all list. You know, Russia is the same way. Again, it's it's kind of fluctuated a little bit. You know, I think prior to the 2016 election, uh, you know, people identify as Democrats saw Russia as less of a concern and Republicans more and that flipped a little bit, but it's starting to flip back again. So these things are there, even when it comes to um, the Middle East, where in Washington, it seems like there's kind of this bipartisan consensus to pull out from the Middle East and say it's not a priority. You look at kind of polling consistently, the one thing the American people thinks is the most important thing, frankly, is to kill terrorists. I mean, there's no other kind of way to say it. Um, and I know that's different than uh, kind of our, our the entirety of our military engagement in the region over the last two decades, among other things, but they see it there. So I actually find that once you get out of Washington on a lot of the bigger things, it's kind of there. When it comes to AHS and the younger generation, so AHS and, and Paul is a, a longtime board member and colleague and, and Mackenzie, you've gone to I don't know how many campuses. And I know in some of these slides, uh, we've, we've dug out some uh, pictures of you visiting some campuses. Uh, so ho hopefully, uh, uh, hopefully won't embarrass you too much. But uh, our mission is to uh, identify, educate and launch uh, young men and young women starting college campuses uh, into the foreign policy world imbued with what we call a Hamiltonian perspective on foreign affairs which essentially means support for a strong and principled American leadership in the world, support for a strong defense and support for the spread of what some people might call universal, or you might call American values. Um, and we bring speakers, scholars, practitioners uh, that kind of share our worldview to campus to actually debate professors at that school on an issue that students choose. And so students get to form chapters on campus across the country. We've been on 80 campuses nationally. Um, bringing really great content. You guys see some of the posters uh, that students have designed over the years. Uh, and it's really kind of student owned and student led. Um, and that, uh, uh, I think, that creates some nice hearts and minds works on campus. Um, as you can imagine, uh, uh, university campuses uh, don't have as uh, rigorous uh, debate or diversity views on special and foreign policy than, than we would hope. Uh, but it also forms the foundation of a network. Um, and so all of our students get to participate in our conferences, our institutes, our seminars, uh, get to know each other, build bonds with each other, uh, build relationships with mentors like, I mean, the two of you uh, and many others. Uh, and ultimately, on our end, uh, help them get jobs, help build the bench. Um, and so we have about a thousand alumni who are officers of our who are officers of our chapters. Uh, there's a quarter of them are in D.C. They're working across federal government. The average age is 26. I mean, we're only 10 years old. And so when you start in college, you kind of stay young. And so we fully expect that uh, this generation will be staffing um, future administrations. I mean, they are already uh, in a variety of ways uh, over the long term. Um, in terms of their views, what I kind of find really fascinating, and this goes back to your first question about the relationship between kind of domestic policy and foreign policy, is that um, I actually find the youngest generation more hawkish on China uh, in particular uh, than the older generation. Um, and a lot of it has to do with uh, the, the nature and behavior of the Chinese regime, not uh, you know, questions of great power politics. Uh, but they are incensed uh, by what the Chinese government has done to the Uyghurs, Tibet, Hong Kong, uh, and its own citizens, for that matter. They're incensed by, you know, the government is lying to them. The Chinese government is lying to the world about COVID. You know, it's not that dissimilar than an older American generation in the 60s and 70s that felt that the U.S. government wasn't uh, giving them the full picture on Vietnam feel the same way. And so it has triggered their, uh, uh, if you will, liberal sensitivities, rightly it triggered their liberal sensitivities in a way that I actually find some of the kids who uh, uh, self-identify as, as liberals are in some ways like even more triggered uh, uh, about China's behavior. And Russia's uh, same thing. Um, and so this this debate uh, or the, the framing of sort of this kind of uh, a foreign policy against illiberalism, if you will, or against authoritarianism, which which, by the way, President Biden does talk about in terms and even Bernie Sanders talks about it in some terms, you know, even though he may not mean it in certain cases, but he does use those words. Um, that actually has an interesting appeal to a lot of these students in that way. So it's really interesting in, in my mind to see that the, the, the hardest thing. And that's where you see the generational map, the gap the most is that um, the younger generation's uh, appreciation for uh, understanding of uh, and uh, and desire to use military force is very, very, very low uh, compared to older generations. 
part of it is a question of people not having served. Part of it is uh, uh, kind of a little bit of, of a kind of anti, you know, government revolt, if you will, against power. And so things gets caught up a little bit in, in Black Lives Matter type things there. But they've they've kind of reached the point where they realize, uh, you know, if I can generalize that, like China is a big, big, big problem. They haven't quite gotten to the point where they say and the U.S. military is a necessary but not sufficient condition to try and stop the spread of the problem or prevent it from getting worse. Oh, boy, I just I want to trigger everyone's sensitivities today. Um, great term, not just liberal, but even our friends on the right. So uh, here, here to that. Hopefully we can do more of that. I'm going to get to hope maybe we can get some triggering in some of these questions. But, you know, I, I'd argue they wouldn't be too wrong in not wanting to use the military more often or in, in different ways. You know, when Americans of any age don't see a change in strategic outcomes as a result of the use of force. And instead they see, you know, um, the Air Force running over people on runways. That's not really a satisfying end to or conclusion to, to the use of force, I would argue. So, you know, understood there. All right, so we're gonna take our first question uh, this morning from Dr. Corey Shockey at AEI. And she talks a little bit about how in our conversation and, and in the, um, the, the document, the Forum for American Leadership document that your team has identified a safe neighborhood as a priority. So by extension, what should the U.S. be doing that we're not doing to make the Western Hemisphere a safer priority, uh, excuse me, a safer neighborhood? I'll, uh, Mackenzie, I'll, I'll jump in. I, um, a couple of things. Um, one is, again, I think there is a sustainable bipartisan position for the following. Um, the U.S. is strengthened by and welcomes uh, legal immigration, um, a system that can be reformed and improved in some ways, um, but is one of the bedrock tenets and foundations of our strength. On the other hand, um, it should also be a bipartisan and sustainable position moving forward um, that we have to control um, the problems at our southern border um, driven by illegal immigration, which themselves are tied to all sorts of things, human trafficking and drug trafficking and so on. So we hope and we set out in our uh, proposed NSS that uh, securing the border and controlling much better than we have been, um, those issues would go a long way to advancing the security and prosperity of the American people. That's one thing. More broadly, I think Corey's question is a broader one about the Western Hemisphere, and of course, she's right to ask. It is worth noting um, that uh, China, among other uh, competitor powers, is trying to increase its influence in the Western Hemisphere through the extension of its Belt and Road Initiative uh, and other means. Um, that is not a constructive or sustainable uh, or mutually beneficial program. It is designed effectively to strengthen China so that it can get what it wants and also extend its influence. And I think we would be well served uh, to think about ways that are resource efficient, um, but to improve uh, both the, the publicity surrounding, but also the substance of our trade and economic engagement within our own hemisphere. And as Corey knows better than anyone, I mean, she's written extensively about this, the Western hemisphere um, we are lucky to be where we are geopolitically with two oceans and a relatively friendly and and um, uh, uh, cooperative neighborhood. And it is essential that we get that right. And can I just add one thing to, yep. to what Paul laid out, which I totally agree with, which is last week, um, the uh, uh, Biden administration, senior White House uh, national security official uh, on background, but on the record, uh, said that in the forthcoming national security strategy in the Western Hemisphere section, the word China will not appear. Um, and that is on purpose uh, because the administration doesn't want uh, uh, the document to make it seem like we just are treating it a region through which uh, there is a competition with China as opposed to a positive agenda for its own reasons. Um, and that again, goes back to the concern before where uh, sometimes it's not, it's not so much a disagreement over what's actually happening uh, between the left and right, but it's, what are we, how are we willing to describe it? What words are we willing to use uh, and not use? Um, and as a consequence, what does that signal uh, about what we should do about it afterwards? Um, and to Paul's point and, and to, to Corey's uh, question, um, you know, 
the Russians and the Chinese are in our neighborhood and increasingly trying to be for their own reasons and to, you know, kind of needle us in a variety of ways. And if we can't just kind of say that forthrightly out loud, how are we, you know, if we can't diagnose it, how could we possibly provide some sort of prescription for it? Agree. Along those lines, we have another audience question anonymous where uh, they're asking that you both written that China cannot be cooperated with and contested at the same time. So what would you both, again, back to the King for a day question, what would you like to see in the national security strategy that cements this as the basis for constructing our policy towards China without sacrificing other strategic goals? Uh, why don't we start with you, Paul? Okay, quickly, I've, in the interim guidance, um, I think the administration pointed to areas of cooperation with China explicitly on uh, climate change, uh, public health and pandemic prevention um, and mitigation, and then arms control and non-proliferation. Um, to quickly, let's start with um, with climate change. Uh, I am skeptical, given what we analyze as China's motivations, that they intend to cooperate with us and with lots of other countries in a way that, that mitigates climate change that would involve any sacrifice or pain on their part in any real way. To me, the way to achieve that, that also understands what China's real goals are, but also critically really makes a difference <laughs> in climate change, which I think we can all stipulate it is a real issue um, and ought to be dealt with expeditiously, is to effectively engage in a tech race with them that they feel they can't lose with us. In other words, to innovate technologically, which is what in fact will reduce uh, carbon emissions. Um, but there's a flip side to that, which is in doing that, we can't put ourselves further in a hole in the relationship with China by being dependent on them for supply chains, supply chains and resources. I mean, that would be counterproductive to all of our goals. Um, and then briefly on the pandemic, I, I will understate this. I think they have been unhelpful and non-transparent, and I will put that euphemistically in terms of both the origins of COVID and how it spread and what the role of the PRC and its government was. And I think we ought to investigate that. I'm sure Congress will after December, after next January, if it isn't done now. Um, and that will provide no doubt some interesting and illuminating issues. And we also ought to think hard about the role of China within institutions like the WHO and why the WHO has been paralyzed, if not conflicted in its investigations in dealing with, with the pandemic. And there is of course a broader tale there, which is you know China's role within international institutions. And then finally, arms control and non-proliferation, not a great record by China. I mean, they, Mackenzie, you know more about this than either of us, but you know, China in fact is growing its nuclear arsenal, for example, um, and certainly its missile you know, force exponentially and seems to have little intention and, and little motivation to engage in any serious arms control discussions. And that ought to change. So we ought to be realistic about how we approach them on these issues. Okay. Let me, can, let me just, sorry. Go get, I'm going to do what I did before. It's curious. I just want to sub, subset question to your answer. Is there a role in these documents or some annex somewhere or some Thing that flows from these documents to help address stuff like that, right? So I remember the Trump administration focusing on the sort of national security industrial base, right? Not just aerospace and shipbuilding, but also the purchasing of software and technology, because we are in this, this race, not just, you know, it's 5G, it's quantum, it's AI, everybody knows the list of, of things we're, we're competing to with each other, not just to be first, but to be better. Is there a role in these documents or some or, or to come from these documents, you know, to address sort of the plumbing of government, um, not like the way the Trump administration did. But for example, in this administration, Congress has set up a commission to look at how the Pentagon programs and resources, uh, basically because we're not competing in the tech race, partly because of the way our Soviet style central management purchasing system at the Pentagon runs. So if, if you want to address that, great. If not, I'll just say the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was going to say, I can kick that part back to you because I think I know where you stand. Um, let me let me address it, but go back to the previous question first. So something I would love to see is for on on this uh, compete versus cooperative, particularly on climate change with China, is that I'd like the administration to just uh, say out loud that actually China is the largest problem uh, when it comes to climate change. Uh, 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 China um, uh, ha puts out more emissions 
per year than the US, the EU, Japan and India combined. And that's only, you know, that gap is only growing. And so at the end of the day, it's not that China is a partner in, uh, in our need to do, you know, X, Y, Z. It's that they are the overwhelmingly uh, the number one problem. And so that, again, goes back to uh, uh, to these questions before. And, and I, I will echo an even stronger language what Paul said about uh, uh, COVID-19 things with the Chinese, right? Which is, um, how, could you, how can you uh, uh, call in the arsonist as the firefighter, right? I mean, that's sort of the problem with some of these things. Um, Arms control is to a certain degree the same thing. I, I'll disagree a little bit with Paul in the sense that I actually, I actually thought it was a pretty smart move by the previous administration to try and enlist the Chinese in some sort of three-way uh, uh, multilateral arms control talks with the Russians and the Chinese. Obviously, it didn't work in the sense that they weren't able to do that. But I, th I thought it was very smart at changing the narrative, uh, trying to create some leverage uh, with the Russians. And, and, you know, and who knows if, if they had more time, how that would have gone. It's too bad the, the Biden administration seems to have you know, said that they'd like to do that, but actually not not really seem to be able to, to do that in some way. Um, the last point on the tech race, I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm going to defer to you, Mackenzie, to all things Pentagon. Uh, uh, the only thing I would say is that um, we should take a step back whenever we get our, our head, you know, too deep into the dark places and say, looking overall, you know, uh, and I, looking over the next 20 years, uh, would I rather be working in tech uh, or am I more confident about sort of the American tech sector or, or the Chinese tech sector? It's a different question as to are we f better or faster at integrating uh, technology into, you know, uh, government particular kind of military purposes. Fair enough. Um, but I don't, you know, people say we're behind or we've fallen behind or we are behind. I think we should take a step back and, and, and kind of, you know, uh, uh, see that with a little bit the benefit of time. You know, right now, if go back on the Russia thing, we're talking about you know, export controls to Russia about things that are critical to their their AI and quantum uh, and other kind of cutting edge technology. And first you sort of look at it, it's like, wait, we're, we've been selling the semiconductors like what's already that's kind of nuts. But the second is like, well, if that's an export control that uh, we actually have a good handle on and is an advantage and leverage for us, then that tells you something about our relative strength on some of these issues. So while well, Gabe is my soundbite machine, Paul, you get the last word this morning. Uh, so we can wrap on time here in about 60 seconds. But it's a great question and from the audience, and I, I really like it. I, I had to squeeze it in. You know, most of these documents tend to, in one way or another, ask the allies to do more, whether that's the from the White House, from the Pentagon, or both. We're going to rely on them more. We need them to do more. And by extension, in some cases, that means we're going to do less, perhaps. Um, I would argue the last administration, perhaps this administration, definitely, as you've already alluded to, both it's explicit. So how should the security strategy balance, you know, sort of reassuring our allies that, you know, they're important, they matter, you know, but also establishing limits for our global activity? Well, it's a great question, Mackenzie. And, and for the audience member who asked it, the one of the first things and maybe the most important thing these documents can do, the NSS and the NDS and the follow on documents, is to state clearly how we think about problems and how we approach the challenges and how we intend to play both offense and defense. In other words, to speak honestly and clearly. Some of that you can't do in a public document. It has to be done you know, in bilateral conversations offline, as it were. Um, but I do think it's important to send strong and clear messages. And I think we talked at the top about how, you know, the in the interim NSS, for example, the message on Russia was was in some ways unclear, in some ways it was clear, but maybe the, the mechanics and the ways and means didn't match the objectives. It's important to speak clearly. And I think that itself treats our allies with, with respect and with uh, actually a certain amount of humility. Here is how we see this, and we intend to work with you for our interests and yours. And just last word on this, and I think we really try to put this into the Forum for American Leadership paper. We are at a pivotal and transitional moment with the, the rise of China, which has been going on and with you know, Russia causing trouble and so on. And if the United States is no longer the predominant power in the world and we are unable or unwilling to set the rules of the road, things will get much worse for the American people very quickly and they will get a lot worse for the allies who are actually on the front lines with these countries. So great term, they need to speak clearly. I'd add to that, speak simply and speak with brevity. We don't need no 80 page documents. Uh, I'm just putting that out there for the record. That that usually means you don't have priorities set well. So um, with that, uh, I've gone on too long. Paul Leto, 
Forum for American Leadership, Gabe Scheinman, Alexander Hamilton Society. It's been as fun as I thought it would. Thanks for joining me this morning. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Mackenzie. Thanks, AEI.